Good afternoon. <laughs> How very nice to see a pretty good turnout today because half of our um, regulars have skived off to somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, and I hope they're having a jolly good time because I know they'll no doubt be watching me, some of them. Um, anyway, welcome to you all. Um, and particularly today, I'd like to welcome John. John Powell, who's going to give us a lecture in a minute. But I'd like to also extend a very warm welcome to his daughter, Emma, and his son-in-law, Alan. Uh, I'd also like to um, welcome members of the, is it the Railway Study Circle or something like that? The Railway Philatelic Group. The Railway Philatelic Group. Um, RPG. Yes. <laughs> is, 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 <laughs> yes. I think we'll leave it at that. Um, but anyway, welcome to them too. It's very, very nice to see, see um, uh, members of other societies taking the opportunity of coming here and, and seeing some really fine material. And I've no doubt at all that once you've seen this building and the friendship and the joy that you have here, you'll be signing up for membership almost immediately. <laughs> anyway, first of all, um, the, the secretary and both of his assistants are... Uh, unfortunately away today. So I've asked Jack Shang, who is a um, uh, council member here, to give us the numbers and to the fire notice, please. He, he's, he's going to do it in Chinese, but so, you know, see how you get on. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, first in Chinese, okay. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> okay, uh, in English. Uh, today, we have got uh, 50 members and the fellows, not too bad, and uh, guests, five. And I'm sure there are more uh, sitting at home watching us, you know, through YouTube. Okay, this is the uh, members. First uh, visitor, uh, first time visit here is Mr. T.R. Smith. Yeah? Okay, welcome. <laughs> And uh, also, we have got uh, Mr. and Mrs. Davis, also first time, right? Okay, welcome. <laughs> okay, I do the fire notice, okay? This is not professional one, this is uh, amateur one, okay? <laughs> uh, if the alarm, fire alarm sounds, you have to leave the building immediately, okay? Don't use... And then go to the fire assembly point, which is in Abchurch Yard. Upon your existing right and enter the yard in front of the church and have the lovely bar, okay? And then a member of the royal will count you there, okay? Thank you very much, President. Okay, professional one later. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. <coughs> now, John Powell <coughs> was not very well known to me until I went to a place called Tempsford, um, which is um, just off the main road, somewhere in the East Midlands. <coughs> and um, we had a chat about um, what was going on at the Royal, and he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I really would love to do something in the way of a, of, of a talk at the Royal. And I said, fine, I'll think about it. Um, which one has to say because there's quite a lot of people who like to do things here. Anyway, um, a vacancy arose, and I asked John if he could do it, and he said, whoa, not much time, old boy. <laughs> anyway, the, the Metropolitan Railway being what it is, it's always on time, and John is here today to give us his talk on the Metropolitan Railway and its railway letter service. John, over to you. Good afternoon, uh, fellows, members, and guests. This is my friend Mark Damon. Are we okay? Yeah, we're getting lots of yeses. As our president said, my name is John Powell, and we're going to embark 
on a swift, philatelic journey on the Metropolitan Railway. This slide, as you see in front of you now, sorry about the legs, <laughs> shows me a few years ago on the footplate of the E-Class number one, the only surviving Metropolitan steam locomotive taken at Quainton Road at a London Transport Museum day. This gives me a bit of time before we start for one or two acknowledgements. First of all, thank you to Peter and his kind words, and I don't really talk like that. <laughs> Peter, our president, for this opportunity. Tempsford is a lovely place, by the way. Also helped by two friends, both long-standing members of the West Africa Study Circle, emphasis, and active members of the Royal, Ray Harris for his PowerPoint, and Rob May for, that, for the handout. I think the handout turned out very well, better than I expected. Also thanks to the ever helpful Mark and Jason. As the President uh, mentioned, it was very nice to see my elder daughter and her husband appear today from the darkest, sh darkest place in Northampton um, to see what I did on Thursday afternoons. Let us set the scene. I've got to work some of it here. In the 1850s, London was terribly congested. It's working. Mark tells me it's working. In the 1850s, London was terribly congested. It was reported that at the time there were 300,000 horses in London and they, ev they even pulled the omnibuses. So in the 1860s, construction commenced to build the underground section from Paddington to Farringdon Street, linking Paddington, Euston and King's Cross to the city. This was undertaken by what is known as the cut and cover technique. This picture gives an indication of what for a number of years must be one hell of a mess. The top of this part of the underground is barely five metres below the road surface. At least you don't have so many stairs to go down. The railway was opened in January 1863 and had to cater for the Great Western Broad Gauge as well as the other railways which were still in standard gauge. This was the world's first underground railway. Here we see a train approaching Harrow round about 1900, still showing it with its condensing apparatus, which was necessary to run in the underground section. From Baker Street, the Metropolitan moved in a northwesterly direction through the rest of Middlesex and Hertfordshire into rural Buckinghamshire. This map shows how far the Metropolitan reached into rural Buckinghamshire, all the way to Verney Junction to link up with the London and North Western. Verney Junction was named, it's so, it's so far from anywhere that it was named after the Lord of the Manor. Just to point out that the section above Aylesbury was originally owned by the Aylesbury and Buckingham Railway, which later on was bought by the Metropolitan. If you were posting or collecting a letter at Baker Street, round about eight, nine, 1910, it would look something like this.
The Railway Letter Service commenced on the 1st of February 1891 after agreement between the post office and the railway companies. It was agreed that a letter would be carried on the next available train. The railway charge was tuppence in addition to the penny postage. Over the years, they tried to keep the balance of twice the price for the railway letter stamp as for the, as for the post office charge. It, it varied over the years, but that was the idea. It was not to exceed one ounce in weight and could be posted at the station or posted in the nearest post office letterbox. The Met did not join until 1895. The reason for this I am not aware. Each railway company had to supply its own stamps. 1775 railway companies used 16 different printers. The Metropolitan chose Waterloo's. They took two impressions of their stock design. The company name was added. And three duplicates were made, one below the other, to form a block of six. This block was used to make ten impressions to give a sheet of 60. The Metropolitan, despite the agreement originally saying these stamps were supposed to be in green, the Met off offered to have theirs done in pink. <laughs> Why, again, I am not sure. I'm going to go back one now. Control numbers were added and they ran from the top to the bottom of the sheet and from right to left. Seems a bit odd, right? Is that Chinese, right to left, or? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they weren't Chinese railway letter stamps. <laughs> Proofs were prepared, both of a perforated type and some imperforate. There's an imperforate block of four shown here. This is a scan, only a scan. It's not part of my collection. I got asked this two or three times today, if only. Um, this is a scan from the Ewan collection, uh, which is in the British Library. Between 1895 and 1920, there were 24 issues of these stamps. And they were sent to the 27 stations on the line. Smaller stations, to give you an idea of the number that there were, the smaller stations only received six, six stamps at a time. Six. <coughs> Here we see a strip of, the th of three mint stamps from the first issue. The agreement between the railway companies and the post office stated they were called a railway servant in those days, but we know who they meant. And they were down to cancel. The railway had to cancel not only their own stamp, but also the post office's stamp. And the Metropolitan tended to go for a cross uh, as their standard cancellation. Uh, but as, as, we w as you probably saw from the display today, there was a bit of artistic license and there were squiggles and union jacks and various other things. Illustrated here is a cover from the first issue showing the correct usage. This was as it was supposed to look, at, look like. 
So we've got the, the two adhesives paying the penny post office rate and the tuppence paying the, the railway letter stamp. Likewise, a similar one from the second issue. One or two more covers. As far as the issues was concerned, the first six issues were of 600. So we're talking about 600, not, not thousands or millions, 600 each. And after that, they were of 1,200. So again, not massive amounts. This is the ninth issue uh, with a nice Queen Victoria tenpence paying the express fee. They're waving in the front row. Finally, in this section, uh, a cover from the 17th issue. Up till now, things were pretty straightforward. In January 1920 was the first change in the railway letter rate from tuppence to threepence. Little notice was given to the railway companies. It was easy for the post office to change from one valley to another. They probably had stacks of them and they just had to move from their, from their penny to their penny halfpenny. Uh, as far as the Tupney Metropolitan Railway stamps were concerned, they were pretty much obsolete uh, from the day the rates went up. What they did was to surcharge on the 23rd issue of the Met Tuppences with a hand stamp three. This was followed shortly afterwards by the new issue of the Thrupney stamp. In less than six months, the post office decided to up their rates again, taking the Metropolitan and other railway companies' rates up with them. So the Thrupney stamp, which had only been valid for less than seven months, now had a manuscript, sorry, not a manuscript, a hand stamp for, which we can see here. Followed, as you might guess, by a new, a new fourpenny stamp. Although it's philatelic, this is my only effort at a fourpenny stamp on a cover, but I suppose because it's on the British Empire exhibition stationery, um, perhaps add, it, add something to it. In 1928, we're leaping forward a few years, uh, unheard of in this day and age, but the rate was reduced. Again, railway companies were unprepared and the fourpenny values were surcharged with a three in black ink. Good, good fun this, isn't it? Even more bizarre, a few of the Thrupney stamps from 1920, which had not been used after they were surcharged for, <laughs> were resurcharged re with a hand stamp three. So they hadn't sold them, so they hopefully they were going to sell them this time around. The final Metropolitan issue was in 1933 with a new threepence, similar to the threepence from 1920, but these, we can tell these are different because these are perforated 14 and are relatively scarce. I possess one used copy. I'm just checking anybody's gone to sleep yet. No, brilliant. 
I'm just going to pop back for a minute to our map and it shows, shows the route of the metropolitan extension as we spoke about earlier. It doesn't come out very well, but the, um, the part of the extension line north of Harrow is shown in green. Does it look like green from where you're sat? Yeah, yeah. Oh, hooray, 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 hooray. In April 1906, the Metropolitan Extension Line, north of Harrow, was leased to a new Metropolitan and Great Central Joint Committee. <coughs> this was in the days when the Great Central were trying to find their way from Manchester and Lincolnshire and Liverpool down to um, Marle what was then Marylebone Station, which it still is Marylebone Station. The metropolitan pink stamps were withdrawn. These were replaced by new stamps, again lithographed by Waterloos, still in sheets of 60, but were in blue, just to change it around a bit. This sheet is uh, by courtesy of the British Library um, and, a, and a scan of one of the Tupney blue sheets from the Sydney Turner collection. The Metropolitan stamps were left with the stations below Harrow, but as these were all in the London Postal District, they were very little used. Used, used Metropolitan pink stamps of a later date are, are scarce. There were nine issues, each of 1,200 stamps, over a period of five years. The no, somebody no less than the Countess of Buckinghamshire, who ha happened to live in Great Missenden, she received this letter five stops down the road from Quainton Road. I've put in these two used copies from the ninth issue because they were actually posted on the same train. Not madly interesting, but <coughs> there we go. Three further issues, but in a darker greyish blue. And that, sorry, that was the, I was, that shows the difference. Does it look obvious that it's greyish blue as distinct from blue? Uh, give me some feedback. Excellent. These, I these issues I've found, I've been, I've been collecting these off, off and on with some degree of seriousness for 30 years. Th these, latter, these latter Tupney blues are, are quite scarce. I do have this nice cover to Aylesbury. We don't know where it's come from. Um, I understand there was some discussion um, earlier. So I think somebody knew Mr. Crouch. No, perhaps I was dreaming. In 1914, the Met and Great Central changed printers to H. Blacklock. I think they were basically Manchester-based, but they did have offices in London. There were five issues produced in sheets of 12 stamps. So here you can see, you can see the difference. The lettering, the lettering is different and the control numbers are considerably larger. So they're pretty obvious. My one and only Blacklock cover with a tuppence used to Chiswick Park, no less. In 1916, the title was altered. And this was the first time they were printed in green, in sheets of 12. And interestingly, 
without control numbers. Here is just a, a com comparison between the last Blacklock Tuppence and the new. So you can actually see, by magic, how the titles were changed. One of these Tuppany greens without the control numbers on a, on a cover to King's Cross. The Met and Great Central obviously <coughs> suffered from the same change of rates as did the Met. Dates were the same. They followed the post office as, di as did the Met. So the rate went up from tuppence to threepence and control numbers had now, now returned. Excuse me. <coughs> Again, later in 1920, as we said before, there was the second increase and there was manuscript four on the threepence. Sorry, it was a hand stamp four. A hand stamp four on the threepence, which I think you can just about... They did these purpley, purpley, uh, not, not very distinct. Can you see it? Excellent, keep nodding. Foreign and colonial letters, which hadn't been part of the original agreement, they were allowed from 1910, as shown in this <coughs> fourpenny cover to California. I'm not sure as it could have got to USA for a penny halfpenny, but perhaps we'll overlook that. In 1928, as you will no doubt remember from a quarter of an hour ago, the rate was reduced to threepence, and here is a three in black ink. The last issue of the Met and Great Central is, th is the last threepence with the control numbers in a somewhat unusual format. Again, no real ideas why. As you remember from your railway history, <coughs> the hundreds of railway companies in the UK were all grouped in January 1923. And the Great Central came under the control of the London and Northeastern Railway. They issued, to start with, it was in the fourpenny rate period, so they produced a, a fourpenny in green. Now, I know we have this debate about um, philatelic covers and, and the fact that I've said you've got to sneak the odd one here. Uh, this is the only unsurcharged un fourpence, either mint or used, that I've ever seen. And it just happens to be on a Wilson cover. So I've, I've put it in. Again, as before, the rate came down and the uh, Met and LNE stamps were surcharged by three in black ink. Finally, in the Met and LNE is the Thrupney stamps, and here is a nice, a nice block to finish off. We're going to have a quick look, and I mean quick, we're going to have a quick look at parcel and newspaper stamps. The Railway Philatelic Group, which Peter obviously knows a lot about, um, they are, their members, including me, we are trying to put together uh, an up-to-date catalogue of these. Would you believe the last catalogue for railway parcel and newspaper stamp was published in 1906? So this is what this is what they look like. So the Met the Met had a series for their parcel delivery service, um, and I can do this. This is good, isn't it? This is Mr. Harris, I tell you. So that's 
that's the little set of the metropolitan parcel and newspaper stamps. The metropolitan and great central had some in green. At least they're colourful, aren't they? And also some in blue. I think they're the wrong way round. I, although there's some debate about this, I'm pretty sure the blue ones were issued before the green ones. In 1933, the London Passenger Transport Board came into being, incorporating all rail, tram and bus services. The Metropolitan Directors and Shareholders were all paid off, and the Metropolitan became part of London Transport. London Transport issued their own parcel stamps, some with the word executive on the stamps and some with the word board. Not sure of the difference, why they should be, but there we go. I'm just going to say a few words uh, about the British Library have the Ewan and Turner collections. Ewan was one of the earliest collectors and in 90, 1906 had accumulated, pay attention here, 13,278 of the 16,217 different railway letter stamps. That's 1906. Now, interestingly, through the Railway Clearing House, a lot of the railway companies refused to sell their railway letter stamps to collectors and dealers. And as part of that, uh, I think it was the LNE, definitely the Midland, and also the Metropolitan. So Mr. Ewan was having great difficulty getting, because he was a dealer as well, of course, and you've probably seen his, some of his price lists of the time. Um, so he, he sent checks to the Metropolitan headquarters for issues of stamps and the Met kindly sent his checks back. He even, this is from the correspondence in the British Library, uh, he actually got to have a meeting with the Met's managing director, all to no avail. So what did he do? See these little forms? Again, this is from the Ewan correspondence in the British Library. He wrote to the booking clerks at the stations on one of these forms. On a single day in October 1898, he sent 1,000 1, applications in the day. And these cost, so he used to put a penny stamp on his letter, a penny stamp on the letter to get the stamps back, and fourpence to get two railway letter stamps. So they sent a thousand of these out, and they were sending these out to every railway company in the country. So that would equate to 25 pounds. I suspect Mr. Bailey knows exactly what 25 pounds is in today's money. A bit more. A little bit about Metroland, a very little bit about Metroland. Uh, these were housing developments on surplus land owned by the Metropolitan, basically to create commuters. Uh, without the houses, there were no people, and without the people, they weren't selling many tickets. In the 1920s, you could buy a nice freehold semi, semi for £875, as much as some people's mortgage increases at the moment, I guess. And if you were really well off, a four-bedroom detached would set you back £1,075. <laughs> you will be pleased to know 
that that was my penultimate slide. Thank you for your patience. And I'm going to send you on your way for your wine and nibbles and a safe journey home with a few words from one of the Metropolitan's great supporters. Hello. Thank you, John. I think it's the first time we've had um, video uh, slides in our PowerPoint presentations here. Certainly, uh, I don't remember seeing them before, so congratulations on that. Absolutely marvellous. Um, but one of the things that uh, I didn't mention earlier is that um, John and I do have a, 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 an interest in plants. Uh, as you know, I uh, spent a lot of time um, with big trees in Borneo. He, uh, when he's not um, fiddling around with metro stamps, he is growing things, and he has more certificates, I think, for first prizes in horticultural shows than he probably has metro stamps. So uh, that's a, another nice link, John, isn't it, that we enjoy together. Now, um, I'm going to ask if there's any questions, um, and here's one. Uh, Thank you very much for your presentation. I enjoyed it enormously. Thank you. Just a couple of points, that's all. It's not really questions. Um, you showed the, the erroneous overprint three on three, the green overprint on the three. Uh, because of the small numbers of issues to each of the stations, I think it's just, a, just an administrative exercise to either cancel them or to show that, the, 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 that the, those stamps still existed there and they were able to then reselling them. I think it's just an admin. admin. Um, the other point is about the colour, the greyish blue. Uh, in, in printing terminology, that's called monochrome. It's but it is really a base colour for mixing inks, and I think they just were cutting back on the cu on the cost of inks. Okay, that's Some, something I've learned. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you for any. Thank you anyway. <coughs> John, that was fascinating. As a Chesham resident, we obviously resonate with what you've been talking about. And uh, my guests today also live in Chesham. Uh, but that wasn't the question. I'm astonished. I mean, I was well aware that there were large numbers of railway companies. I'm aware about Ewan and all the rest of it. But if you look at the economics of this, small printings of 1,200 or even less, 600, the railway company didn't actually make a lot of money out of this, did they? Probably not. No. Yeah. I, I have to go back a long way in my economics, but um, sorry. Yes, I'm. I'm sure you're right. I've, I've, nev I've never particularly thought about that, but uh, yeah. You know, I mean, even in those days, tuppence wasn't a lot of money, was it? Um, the, the problem would be that. For a printing like that, now I know they had set designs for many of them, so the actual work to put in the names and so on, but then you've got the production costs. Is there any literature knowing what the cost to the railway companies were for producing the 600 or 1,200? I've, I've not found anything. The only, say, the only I've, I've had a good look through the what's in the British Library, um, but there's nothing in there as about the production of them. Um, I don't know, do Waterloo's have a have a, an archive or anything? I'm I'm not sure. It's dispersed, I think. Dispersed, mm. yeah. So perhaps we perhaps we won't know. I mean, the numbers are, as I somewhat tongue in cheek, put put somewhere about. Uh, uh, I think I think there's one issue which is 240 stamps, mm. um, and, in, and and in one and in one day they sold half a million penny blacks. So uh, that speaks for itself, I suppose, doesn't it? But you're looking at a lot of items which make post office Mauritius look terribly common. A comment and then a couple of quick questions. Um, I did wonder when I was looking downstairs whether the red colour of the first stamps actually was at least an attempt to match the colour of the locomotives, which was also in a dark. It was a maroon. Red. A maroon. 
yeah. Uh, um, quite possibly. Uh, quite possibly. It's, it's, uh, I, I was very interested in, in your topic, having an interest in railways as well as collaterally. Um, I, I wondered not so much about the economics, but about the time savings of using the train. I notice a lot of your non-philatelic covers are inwards from the country towards London. And I wonder th whether the lack of, what tr uh, of letters from London outwards is because the post office actually, of course, was using the trains themselves yeah. for ordinary mail. Therefore, the main market for this was in small villages, as they were then adjacent to stations, uh, where you could run to the station knowing there was a train going in half an hour yep. and send a letter, whereas if you put it in the post box, you might wait some time before it was collected. I, I, think, uh, I, I think a lot of it came out of, the, of the, the years of squabbling between the railway companies and the post office. And, y and you've all heard the story. So the, we know that the uh, railway companies carried the parcels. The post office did not have a monopoly for parcels. Um, and people went through a phase of putting string around their letters to, to, to con the post office that they were parcels so that they could put them on the railway. So there must have been, and there, there was a serious complaint uh, of in the band of, a, of an hour to half an hour out of London that the express service was rubbish. And that's why people tried to get around the post office monopoly. And I think that's what the, the post office and the railway companies eventually got their heads together and, and cobbled up this. My final question is simply, it, it relates to the fact that the uh, stamps all relate to a single railway company. There was never any ability to, uh, for letters to be passed, for example, in the north of England particularly, from one railway company to another for onwards transmission. Oh, yes. There was, there's only, I think there's only one cover, one cover that springs to mind, which went to Horsham. So that must have... Traverse, so it's postmarked when it gets to London Northwest, and then it gets put on a train that's going south. That's your part of the world, is it? Um, so it's going south to Horsham. So yes, it does, but they are few but and far between. Uh, so it was a, s a second railway journey, yes. not the post office. No. Okay. Well, thank no. you. So it's actually that cover is actually postmarked Horsham Station. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good. I think it's now time for a vote of thanks. And we have our very good friend Jack here, who's been researching for weeks doing this. <laughs> and uh, he's going to give us a vote. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, President. To be honest, you know, until yesterday afternoon, when our president sent an email asking me doing this uh, vote of thanks, I almost, almost knew nothing about this stand, okay? But thank you for inviting me to do this vote of thanks. And uh, thank you, John, for such a lovely presentation. Wonderful. I trust everybody has learned something. And uh, whether you are you collecting this kind of stamps or not, uh, just like what I said, until yesterday, I knew a little bit, right? I did see one or two such stamps, but uh, not in details, you in know, information. And uh, however, through John's talk, and uh, I did a little bit of research last night, <laughs> <laughs> because I have to do something, right? Otherwise, I don't know what... Uh, I should talk about today, right? And uh, I can say that at least I, I learned something and uh, say the first metropolitan railway line was from Paddington to Farringdon Street, right? And uh, that is the world underground, right? Railway line, that's very good. To be honest, I did use, you know, metropolitan line and uh, until yesterday, I finally know, you know, this is the 
first metro uh, underground line in the in the world, and of course in the Lon in London too. <laughs> okay, and uh, we also know, uh, of course, we saw the metropolitan railway uh, construction site in 1861, right? And also some nice uh, videos, and uh, it's the first railway letter for, uh, post established in February 1891, etc. Regarding uh, the Metropolitan Railway letter stamps, we also learn from uh, John's talk uh, what to do and the sense created that two lovely impressions first by using their stock design and then added the Metropolitan Railway name and they duplicated them one by one and finally made uh, a whole shape, uh, 60 impressions. Very good. And uh, originally I thought, uh, you know, that uh, 60 uh, impression shape is yours. Uh, it is British libraries, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, we have seen some lovely stamps with uh, or without perforation. Uh, numbered mint stamps and the used first issue and also some early usage of this uh, lovely uh, stamp. Uh, of course, according to uh, Ewens, I just learned this uh, uh, surname, how to pronounce it, you know, to be honest, I originally I thought it's Ewen, it's Ewen. Ewen's book published in 1901 only for the first issue, he mentioned only about three or four unused specimens known. And this gentleman showed us today how much first issue I have in my, in my notes. Five. Five today. You know, more than uh, that uh, lovely gentleman's book, you know. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, uh, he showed us uh, some, you know, rare uh, covers with uh, this lovely stamp for the second issue, uh, number uh, 958, right? And I think this kind of be very rare, in my opinion, right? And uh, of course, John also showed us some other values and such as the stamp used on envelopes, uh, metropolitan and Great Central Railway stamps used on covers, uh, stamps uh, Metropolitan, London, and the Northeastern Railway, etc. Right? Too much. I cannot uh, uh, name them all here. Overall, John's talk today and uh, his collections told us a great story about the history of the Metropolitan Railway and its letter stamps in a, in a very knowledgeable and uh, educational way, I think. And uh, last, I would like to mention here, I did uh, uh, some homework yesterday, right? And, uh, and I found as early as 1897, the second year of our society's establishment, a gentleman called C.F. Dandy Marshall he did give a talk on the same subject for the royal. Yeah, and also this gentleman's topic is notes on the railway letter of free stamps of Great Britain and Ireland. And uh, his paper published in LP volume six in December 1897. I just got these details last night. 12 o'clock, exactly. <laughs> okay, and, and the, his talk led to the uh, study of this issue, of the issues of the different railway companies. And uh, of course, the same companies about the railway stamps in colors and the perforations and also other details. And, uh, Another lovely thing is,
this gentleman, Mr. Marshall, you know, he won our society's medal, Crawford Medal, in 1928. So we, we got everything right here. Your <laughs> and uh, and uh, now, 125 years later, our society's fellow, John, of course, one of three Johns I know very well, and uh, give us, you know, a talk, followed, you know, uh, Marshall's step, right? And uh, I have to say, thank you very much, John, and uh, Mr. Marshall might be watching us in the paradise, <laughs> right? And he will say, John, thank you very much. Well done, John. You are doing better than me because you know how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for such a lovely uh, presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Jack. I'm delighted to say that your arithmetic and mine is exactly the same. I wrote 125 years on here just in case you didn't. John, it's now my great pleasure to present you with um, a certificate and also um, your plaquette. I shall have to put this down because I can't. I'm not an octopus. I only have two pieces. Right, I think that concludes the um, uh, business to do with um, the Metropolitan Line. Um, but I have one or two other pleasant duties, one of which is to present to Richard Berry a certificate for uh, his Zoom uh, presentation, which was on the 4th of October. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I was, um, well, actually, well, no, unfortunately for him and fortunately for me, um, I was um, wandering about in Ely. So, um, collecting the Rhodesian Bush War and the transition to Zimbabwe, I understand, and I've seen it, it's a really, really fascinating p piece of, of, of philatelic research. It was something which um, was really rather out of the ordinary, and I hope that uh, it's still on the, on the website to see, and I do hope you will. And uh, Richard, if you kindly come step forward, I'd like to present you with this. This is, this is a very special um, certificate, because it has two signatures on. Uh, one is electronic and the other one is in ink. On the uh, 20th of October, we were hoping to have a meeting here uh, addressed by um, Hubert de Belder from uh, Belgium. Unfortunately, he is not well enough to travel to this country, and, and bearing in mind the very short period of time, I'm afraid we've had to cancel that meeting. On December the 7th, um, we're going to rededicate the War Memorial, which is um, just downstairs outside the door of the current uh, exhibition. Uh, the Bishop of London is going to come to do her uh, rededication and uh, there will be a note uh, in the LP and on the um, in one of my letters fairly soon with an Eventbrite uh, registration. So if you'd like to come to that uh, please do register with the Eventbrite system and uh, we will then be able to provide you uh, with a bit of space, but also, hopefully, a glass of wine and a sandwich for lunch. Um, the next online meeting uh, is on the 1st of November, and that is UK High Value Packet Mail, 
by Kim Stuckey. Now, he's stuck in um, Cornwall at the moment, which is why he's not doing what Jack very kindly did for us. Um, but uh, he'll be on Zoom at 3 p.m. on the 1st of November. The current display downstairs is The Life and Conditions in Mauritius, from 1680 to 1870 by Robert Marion, and that will be there until the 16th of October. And finally, choo-choo! <laughs>